from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon and welcome to the Library of Congress. This program is made possible by the Office of Equal Employment Opportunity and Diversity Programs. Our guest speaker, Sam Martinez, served 26 years with the Federal Bureau of Investigation as a special agent. Over the years, the FBI assigned him to a myriad of postings in San Francisco, Chicago, Denver, Mexico City, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C., and Montevideo, Uruguay. He worked cases involving white-collar crime, domestic terrorism, narcotics, foreign counterintelligence, and undercover assignments. He worked on the Patricia Hearst kidnapping, the Black Panther Party, and the FALN, a Puerto Rican terrorist group. In Mexico, he was the FBI case agent and supervisor to the kidnapping and murder of DEA agent Enrique Quique Camarena. His last assignment was supervising, coordinating, and authorizing overseas drug cases with the DEA. He joined lead plaintiff Matt Perez and 310 other Hispanic agents in filing a class action lawsuit on employee discrimination against the FBI. The lawsuit was not about hatred or bigotry, but subtle and unintentional discrimination which became evil when management retaliated against those investigative agents it relied on for its success. The court ordered systems implemented after the trial benefited the FBI with greater opportunities for all agents, developed transparency and promotion policy, and caused the FBI to promote women at an unprecedented rate. He is the author of Systemic Evil, Matt Perez versus the FBI, and he plans to write books on less serious subjects. The book won the Southwest Book Award from the Border Regional Library Association. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, retired FBI Special Agent Sam Martinez. Thank you, everyone. Um, since it's being video, uh, would you please make sure you get the Library of Congress so I can send it to my mom? She'll be very proud of me. <laughs> Thank you, Roberto Salazar and the Library of Congress for inviting this starving artist to be here today at noon. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate the Library of Congress for having me here at, at lunchtime. Um, so we all have something in common. You're a hungry audience, and I'm a hungry author. <laughs> I am sincerely honored with the opportunity from the Library of Congress and for you taking the time to listen and ask questions at the end of my presentation. I'm also honored that we have retired agent Ed Mireles in the audience. I will read you his story and invite him here at the end to answer questions that you might want to ask him. Has any one of you had a chance to discriminate today? Good. I see some. I see some people in the that. Cafeteria. I, I, I got the ugly food. It's kind of the super ugly food. Good. Uh, I'm glad you raised your hand because there's, people are afraid to talk about discrimination. And discrimination, there's. I'm going to talk about the good side of discrimination and the bad side of the discrimination. Um, has any of you seen at least a dozen movies of the FBI? Come. It seems like we all raised your hands. Have any of you seen an agent cry in any of those movies? I didn't think you would. Has, have any of you had your judgment wrong about people? I see hands going up also. Look up the word discrimination. You'll see that humans discriminate every day. Discrimination is the decision-making process. It's a natural process within us. Good discrimination our choices and actions that we make that don't affect others. People used to say, he's a distinguished uh, 
man with discriminating taste. There's nothing evil about that. There's nothing bad about that. We use discrimination as a survival instinct. Mark Cuban tried to discuss discrimination as a survival instinct when he said, I know I'm prejudiced and I know I'm bigoted in a lot of ways. If I see a black kid in a hoodie walking down the street, on my side of the street, I'll cross over to the other side of the street. If I see a, a white guy with tattoos and a shaved head on my side of the street, I'll walk back over to the other side of the street. None of us have pure thoughts. He intended no harm to others. He spoke his truth, he spoke his beliefs, he spoke his, his security. And the blacks and the media and others jumped all over his comments. The much needed discussion ended. A better way towards mutual respect is to engage directly with the moral convictions citizens bring to life rather than leave moral convictions aside. We have to listen first, understand, and engage in the dialogue, not when we're angry, but engage when, we're, 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 when we want to listen. Mild discriminations are stereotypes, stereotypes such as food. Some people would say, do you want chili on your tacos? And there's some Mexicans that don't put chili on their tacos. Some people don't like the taste. Um, we stereotype people with noodles or fried chicken or curry. Those are mild forms of discrimination. They still don't affect others. But people are unaware how they can affect someone or pigeonhole someone, even by surnames, culture, language, looks, the color of the skin. Harmful discrimination is protected by law. I know Lorena Sierra is here. She's an EEO officer. She's protects the, dis the disability, the age, people of gender, race, ethnicity. The, those are protected by laws. Some people use discrimination to make themselves feel better while making others feel less. When used this way, it's the attackers that are making less of themselves and less of this country. When you define others, you define yourself first. Negative discrimination is, a, is an attempt to steal your identity of who you are. No one talks about white on white discrimination, but it happens. Just ask William S. Sessions, former director of the FBI, about persona and his identity theft by discrimination. Our persona is more important than our data. Who we are is more important than when someone else believes. No other person is invested in us more than we are. Don't let anyone steal your identity. Oppression and injustice are discrimination. This book is about work discrimination, where we're agents, we're trying to get a fair deal, uh, fair assignments, um, fair promotions, and uh, we were being held back. Um, the worst type of discriminations are, come from hate, fear, and retaliation. I was in Mex assigned to Mexico City when the lawsuit um, began, and I came. I transferred in from the Denver office. When I transferred back in from Denver um, uh, to testify, uh, an agent who I had worked with, a, a friend of mine, pulled me aside and said, "Hey, I want to talk to you about this lawsuit." I went over to the to, uh, he took us, took me to a, a room where the, they kept the work boxes. We went there, and he, and he said, uh, "What's this lawsuit about? We don't hate you guys. We may hate the blacks, but we don't hate you." <laughs> and and I found out that he was he was he was kidding, but it, it wasn't. You know, our case was not about hate. It was not. Um, that was the last thing that, that the bureau. Um, felt against the Hispanic agents. They just set us aside and, and forgot about us. Um, and it wasn't just management. The FBI Agents Association was formed for the, for the purpose of, uh, of attacking uh, or defending themselves against management. management uh, in, this, in the late 70s, 
uh, when the COINTEL program and uh, other, other programs started and, and the FBI agents were accused of uh, what they call black bag jobs, going in without warrants and things like that. Uh, then they, they started making the agents scapegoats, so they started the Agents Association to protect the agents against management. Well, when the Hispanics filed a lawsuit, and it was against management, it wasn't against our colleagues, uh, the F FBI Agents Association decided to side on, on the side of, of management and not, not the agents. Um, FBI agents are supposed to be strong, ethical, just, um, truthful, inquisitive. Let me read for, for you just a minute from, from, from the book about Ed Mireles, who's our guest here. This is One Day in the Life of Ed. Two FBI agents, Jerry Dove, Ben Grogan, died in a hail of gunfire as five other wounded agents battled through the carnage of April 11, 1986, a crime perpetrated by two armed and dangerous U.S. Army Rangers trained killers. Faced with the superior firepower of assault rifles, the FBI agents stood as a team with a purpose and defended one another. Agents lay dead and wounded in a quick exchange as over 130 bullets created bloody chaos. As the two bank robbers attempted to escape in a stolen FBI car, Special Agent Edmundo Mireles, Jr., despite being dazed from one gunshot to the head and another that left his left arm paralyzed, while still under fire, sat up, supported himself against a nearby car, then using his body, his knees, and his right hand, cocked and fired all the rounds in the sh shotgun as at the suspects. Faced with death, his fear dissolved into anger and de determination to stop the killers. Ed dropped the empty shotgun, pulled his revolver out, staggered towards the getaway car, shot and emptied all of his ammunition, leaving the perpetrators dead. Ed survived, and in recognition of his actions, the FBI awarded him the first ever FBI Medal of Valor. Yet even before that dark and tragic day, Ed had survived other shots, wounds of discrimination, when he sensed rejection within his FBI community. Ed would testify to discrimination in the Bureau, but not as a class member. I remember Ed's testimony in, on the day he, he testified. His hands, he was wringing his hands. He was crotched. His head was down. He spoke in a low voice. His voice cracked at times. He was nervous. You may want to ask him why. Why a different Ed than the one that won the Medal of Valor? Let me add that three agents cried while testifying. One of them was my compadre Greg Rodriguez. Greg and I were partners in, in Chicago. We worked the FLN cases. We knocked on doors. Uh, morning, mid day, and, and night. Uh, we worked 16-hour days. Um, and Michael Deutsch, who was an attorney for the FALN, uh, every time he sued the FBI, it would, he, they would have uh, Greg's name and my name um, on the on the affidavit. But some days we weren't even present. We, some days we weren't even working. We had a reputation of going out there and knocking on doors and trying to solve cases. Um, try testifying against a dysfunctional family or a dysfunctional school you attended or a religion you follow that covers up abuse or an agency that represents Lady Justice, Mother Bureau, Father Faith, fidelity, bravery, and integrity. Testifying against the Bureau wasn't easy for me. It wasn't easy for Ed. Um, during the trial, there was a lot of words that came out. Uh, Tamale Squad. Tamale Squad was when agents first came in in 1970. Um, the Bureau didn't know what to do, so they 
put them all in, in one squad. Called it, and so we started calling ourselves the Tamale Squad. Um, the taco circuit started. The taco circuit, um, a friend of mine last weekend, um, Evan Dobbs, told me, he says, that's the first time I've heard taco used as an adjective. And what was happening was that the bureau was, was the supervisor was going out into the, the bullpen and saying, you Mireles, uh, go out, we need you TDY 90 days in Puerto Rico or Los Angeles or New York or wherever on a case. Um, but in that bullpen was also Adams, Williams, Jones, who also spoke Spanish. But it was easy for the supervisor to see Ed Mireles because of the color of his skin, Ed Mireles because of his, his uh, surname, for him to get those duties. Um, he wasn't thinking it was out of abuse. Um, but when it became, it became, it became, even when it became abuse, when we started telling people, this is, you know, how come it's not happening to, happening to them? And that's when they, they got upset that you questioned management. And so then that's when the retaliation uh, began. Um, on promotions, there was agents that were more qualified than others. And it was a good old boy system. A good old boy system, picking your friends is easier. Working with your friends is easier than picking somebody who's uh, touched, touched all the bases and you don't know them. And you say, well, I'll just pick, pick my friend. And that happens. That happens quite a bit. So it was that type of discrimination that was, that was going on in the Bureau. Um, the other, the other word that was that came up in the in the bureau was Anglo helper, and Anglo helper was was because uh, we would get assigned uh, cases and we would have responsibility for them. When the responsibility came, um, uh, let's say Smith had uh, a case where that needed Spanish speaking speakers, he would take us. They would take us off our cases go work with them, come back, and, and since they didn't speak Spanish, we would have to transcribe them. So we actually became what they called Anglo, Anglo helpers. There's also, uh, in, in, in the book, there's, when Matt Pettis was in El Paso as the ASAC, he told his SAC, he says, we need more Spanish speakers because these people are getting drained from their work. And uh, the S SAC said, well, who's going to talk to the bankers? As if Spanish speakers don't talk to the bankers. Spanish speakers speak English, too. Um, Al Nava, in his, in his book, testified to the, the fact that he was assigned to Puerto Rico and, and was an Anglo helper because agents were being sent to Puerto Rico that didn't speak Spanish. So he would have to go work their cases, work his cases. and. Uh, uh, that uh, the term Anglo helper came up uh, in trial. FBI Director Comey visited El Paso and said, anytime you have people in power, you're going to have at some point people who go sideways as a result of that power. You just have to show, hold people accountable. That's what I was doing, holding people accountable. I did not testify against the Bureau. I did not testify against colleagues. I love the Bureau. I love my colleagues. I testified against management. The people I worked for, the people I worked with, I was in management. The FBI is perfect. Individuals are less than perfect. I am less than perfect. The Director Comey knows that the FBI was constructed as a perfect organization. I want to keep it that way. Educated, experienced, and responsible Hispanic agents had the ideal work ethic required for a premier law enforcement agency. Hispanics had learned to accept their humble beginnings, their accents, their language, their culture, their surnames, their skin color, who they were. It was time for the FBI management to learn Hispanic men and women deserve career opportunities. Hispanic looked just as good as any other agents in trench coats, wingtip shoes, fedoras, or FBI raid jackets, whether they have blue eyes, 
green eyes or beautiful brown eyes like mine. Let's see if you agree with me that the actions of some supervisors within the FBI was evil. I was, I got assigned to Mexico City as a case agent for um, Kiki Camarena. In, in between that time, I got a call from a, a person who wanted to give wanted to give me some information. He had, apparently he had given some, the information to to the office before, and nobody did anything about it. So I called him in, listened to him, sp spent the whole day with him, and told him I needed about three days to write it out, and I would call him back so I could see, make sure I got everything right. I did, and he came back, and we made some changes and sent it out to the Bureau, and he was hiding, he was a, a bodyguard for one of the, uh, um, high, uh, one of the president's uh, cousins um, who was running drugs in Mexico. And so he decided when the earthquake came, um, he decided to hide out and decided he wanted, he wanted to get out of what he was doing. He had, I, at that time, we had two, two good cases that were FBI cases that could, we could have used him for, but my boss said, give him over, hand him over to DEA. Didn't want anything to do with him. So we handed him over to DEA, and DEA was working the Kiki in the case, which is, was a high priority case. He, uh, uh, he had, he was running financially low on, on uh, his money, and, and uh, so I told him, I said, why don't you just leave, go to the U.S. now, and wait for DEA to call you? And he says, well, I don't have any money. I have two guns. Uh, and so I fixed it up for, the, for a security um, guard company to buy the guns from him, which they, they were authorized to do. They bought the guns. I got the money, gave it gave it to the, the uh, informant, and the, the guns ended up in the trunk of the car for that, that first day. And my boss saw it, and I told him what, what had happened, and this and did nothing. A year later, I was accused by uh, uh, Customs and DEA that I was selling guns to informants, which was, which was false. And my boss, uh, do I told him I said this incident this is this has to do with the incident about the 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 two guns uh, from Kermit and so I Kermit's just a name that I uh, I used as a, for him but uh, uh, so Kermit left Kermit left Houston and became an informant for Customs and for DEA and got that that's where that information came from so my boss sends a sends a, a note out to headquarters, um, and uh, I was accused of uh, criminal activity, lack of candor, and insubordination to cover up an event that occurred the year earlier. I knew I could prove I committed no crime. I also knew, unless it's orange of my alma mater, UTEP, I wouldn't look good in an orange jumpsuit. <laughs> However, the, the insubordination and lack of candor charges were my boss's word against me. I requested the FBI polygraph me to prove I followed all my boss's instructions and that I was candid in any inquiry or of the investigation. The one, two, three levels above my boss refused to polygraph me. Who's running this place? Kim Jong-il? I was alive. I had to pinch myself. It was not a dream. I had to do something. I paid a retired FBI polygrapher to examine me. I passed. The Bureau paid no attention to the results and demoted me. Attempts to fix things within the FBI failed. All one, two, three levels of leadership, management weren't interested. I could not understand what integrity or the FBI meant to those managers. What emotion was destroying their sense of reasoning, destroying their sense of responsibility, destroying the essence of investigations within the FBI? I knew what the FBI meant to me. I was embarrassed and sad that I had to take my case to an outside agency, the Merit System Protection Board, who reviewed my case and overturned my demotion. Um, Matt's 
the story of Matt Bettis Bar- is his worse. I'm going to deputize all of you and make you SACs in charge of an office. An office of 62 people, 55 in your field office and, and the other, the rest on, in, out in the field. Just to the north of us, you have a, a Navy shooting of, where 10 sailors are shot, two are killed. That's a major case. On the south of us, you have a, an, uh, an Air, Muniz Air Force Base that's bombed. 25 planes are, are destroyed, t- 12 completely. Just t- on, on the east, east of us, east is this way, east, just to the east of us, you have a, a Navy ship that was bombed. Um, just to, and to the west of us, you have a, a police corruption case that where you're investigating over 40 officers for corruption and, there's, and they're assigned to help you with, with investigations. And, and what would you do now that you're in charge of, the of, of your office? You ask for help. You ask for help from headquarters. You ask, headquarters sent, sent him uh, support. He was asking for, for specifically for Spanish speakers and, and, given, and for 90 days. They turned him down. They sent him whoever they could for 30 days. If you've, ever, if you've ever been to Puerto Rico, you have people that are, uh, you have streets that don't make any sense. The, the language is different. Uh, it's a, a difficult, difficult place to get situated. So you had, to, you had agents that were coming in, you had to situate them, and then they would turn around and, and leave in 30 days, which they weren't being much help. So if they're turned down on on manpower, is that, is that discrimination or mismanagement? I'd go with mismanagement at the beginning. Now you need computers, and you ask for computers, and the, and the executive assistant director says, well, you're behind Springfield. Springfield, you're seventh on the list behind Springfield Division. Springfield Division is it's a small office, too. But they put you, instead of looking at what situation is in Puerto Rico, they, they, uh, they uh, put you in, they, 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 they put you eighth on, eighth on the list. There were seven people ahead of you. The admiral on the base, seeing that, that people have died, people are getting purple hearts, uh, knows the urgency. So he contacts the CIA, and the CIA gives us um, state-of-the-art computers right away. Matt calls the headquarters, asks for computer personnel to run the computers. He's, they say no. Is that mismanagement or is that discrimination? Then he hears from a friend of his who's up in headquarters. The executive assistant director says, let's see how he plans to man those computers now. For me, that's discrimination, and that's evil. No leader, no manager, no one is as important as any agency. No one has the authority to undermine agency values, whether it's the Library of Congress, a corporation, or the FBI. Trump was recently elected as president. He came out and said that Mexicans are rapists, that Mexicans are murderers, that Mexicans are bringing drugs into this country. And I'm okay with that because Scottish people are rapists. Scottish people are murderers. Scottish people also bring drugs into this country. What bothered me was when he said, I assume some of them are okay. When he said that, I I said, I've been living in this country for a long time. I've got five generations on my father's side that are from the New Mexico area, which at at one point was part of Mexico. I've been in this country longer than, than many others. 
when he said, I assume they are okay, that means he doesn't know Mexicans. He doesn't know Mexican Americans. He accuses of a, a, of a judge of Mex Mexican heritage that he would be unfair. He doesn't know Mexicans. My parents, my, not my parents, but my grandparents had land taken away from them in Mexico, in New Mexico. Uh, they, they, they took it away because it was, the deeds were in Spanish. And now we, we became part of the U.S. So they said, we can't read that. We don't honor that. So they gave it to settlers that were moving into the, moving into the New Mexico area and other parts of, of the West. Um, I grew up in, in uh, Lakeside, a subdivision of El Paso. Now you may think that sounds aesthetically great, but uh, I had my view was a, a view of the ditch. But uh, uh, kids, when in grade school, made fun of me because I had holes in my shoes. Um, I had holes in my shoes, but it wasn't me. I didn't have holes in my, myself. I grew up in El Paso with a great group of friends. Oscar, Joe, Ernie, Robert. We went everywhere together. When we were in high school and college, we had to develop our interpersonal skills. We also had to make ends meet. So we would crash parties, weddings, and quinceaneras. We call it networking with food and drinks to boot. <laughs> we're still waiting on the movie, The Quinceanera Crashers. <laughs> Some nights we would crash at one of our homes. If it wasn't at Oscar's house, we would have to stop at his house first. It wasn't to ask permission, but it was there to pick up his blanket that he slept with. For Oscar Barajas, who we call Coke, that black blanket represented his security. We complained the first night, but then we just accepted him as is. Now, before you think this person's speaking to you, hung out with a bunch of wusses and cried on the stand when he testified against the FBI. Let me say that Coke was shot and killed having dinner at Howard Johnson's in Albuquerque when two armed robbers came in and threatened the cashier. They were looking for money, but then they planned to kidnap her. He intervened by trying to calm the gunmen down and protect the cashier. He did not retreat for a security blanket. He rose to the occasion of knowing his identity of who he was. Who he was cost him his life. The robbers took his life, but they did not take away his identity. Ed Miralles did the same thing when he had to stand up. Every day you are creating a new you. Your personal identity is in a constant state of evolution. We all have the power to reinvent ourselves and create a new empowered identity that expands what is possible in our lives. The key is to take conscious control of the beliefs we are creating about ourselves so they can power us towards what we desire most. The power to tap into our tremendous potential comes from our identity, who, how we define ourselves and having faith in what we can achieve. Have faith to let go of who you are at this moment and accept how far you can reach. Your reach has enormous potential beyond what's thought to be possible. Let me do a Miami Senate. Our identity is the strongest influence to our happiness and our actions in life. Living inconsistent to who you are creates a life of disappointment, frustration, and stress. You don't want to live someone's perception of you. You want to live and embrace your authentic self, embrace your deepest beliefs, your deepest fears, your deepest strength to create the almighty harmony in your life. I want you to please look at the person next to you. Please vow that you won't kill the potential in them or others. <coughs> We are here to enjoy the gift of life, vile today from evil thoughts, that you will not diminish, 
disregard or steal anyone's identity of who they are. None of them knows what's inside of you, and you don't know what's inside of them, just as no one knew what was inside of Oscar Barajas. In the face of death, he knew the value of right and wrong. Faced with death, he cared for someone he knew nothing about, more than his own life. Only you know your true identity. Only you know your true potential. Only you know who you are. Let no one steal your identity of who you are. It's your right to inner peace, your right to fairness, your right to the almighty gift of life. Thank you. I'll open it up for question. I also want to ask Ed Mireles to stand up here with me and, uh, and for you to honor him. You, you can ask. You can ask him any questions or ask me any questions that you'd like. Yes, sir. I'm here because uh, my father has a good friend who was, I don't know if he's the FBI, but he was related to that. He's the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, was in the last year or so awarded to an Asian case, Hispanic family like yourself, the generations of uh, Mexican American. Uh, but it took a long time to get through that. So my question is is your case and many other cases like that continue? What does the FBI? I, fi I filed an EEO case on January 1st. I pulled an agent uh, from vacation because my 90 days was was going to end on this on the on the uh, the next on the next day on the 2nd of January. So I pulled him I pulled him off vacation. I said you're taking you're taking my EEO case. So I filed the EEO case, and it took seven years to resolve. Um, my my. What I wanted for them to do was take the lies out of my personnel file. That was that was that's what I wanted. It took them seven years to do that. Uh, so it took it it I didn't see it coming, and that and, and those seven years it just chipped away at what justice meant to me in the FBI, what in, what investigations meant within the FBI. People would they would assign people to investigate EEO cases, and they would say. Well, you can go over there and, and just ask him this part of the question. Don't ask him on this side of the questions. So, you know, if somebody had told me and I had a badge for the FBI, I'd say, no, get somebody else. I'm not doing that. I just couldn't do it. But I see, I see it happening. I know that EEO cases, sometimes they're not as big as what they, what they but people get defensive. People get, uh, supervisors get def defensive uh, when a subordinate says something about them. Uh, uh, and, and that's the last thing they need to do. Um, I wasn't going to talk about it, but you know, just just think of the Ferguson case. You know, it's, it was it was um, uh, was it was it a race thing? You know, we hear it is, but what what about attitudes? Could have been could have just been attitudes where a policeman had a bad day, and a young kid who had just stolen something had a bad day. Uh, and if we start investigating things from that point in and start negotiating, EEO actually needs good, good negotiators. They, they need to find out what it is uh, because people get defensive, you know. Um, you know, racism is, is, is thrown out, uh, um, prejudice or bigoted is thrown out real quick. And um, uh, so people get defensive. They put up a wall automatically. And so you, it's hard to talk through that wall um, when you're trying to get something settled. But I don't see there any, um, I haven't reviewed, to be honest with you, I haven't reviewed any EEO cases. But I know that back when I was doing the book, it was, it was EEO cases, um, uh, less than 10%, less than there, was, there was some kind of findings on it. So you think, is it possible that one in, that nine out of ten people are making up false claims? Um, I think there's there's a lot of unfairness, just like I spoke about the unfairness. 
I think it was unfair to, to for Judge Sessions to be um, removed from from the bureau as a as a director when he flew out to San Francisco to visit his to see his daughter in a ballet uh, um, and also visit the office that the previous director would uh, go and talk to a boys club and then go and ski and play tennis in the mountains of Denver, Colorado. So it was, it was for me, it's, it's, there's, the system is unfair, but it's, it's not always um, discrimination, but it's, um, I, I really can't answer it to you as, as if they're getting shorter, um, but they should. They should. If you get a, if you ask for a good negotiator to negotiate some kind of agreement, but it's kind of hard to prove discrimination. Just like I said, is it if if, he, if an agent gets if if you're in charge of an office and there's four major cases going on and that somebody is slow at sending you manpower, is it stupidity? Is it mismanagement? Um, can, when when do you put the finger on that it's discrimination? And discrimination ought to be looked at. Is it unfair for you to do this? If it's, uh, is, uh, is, is, is it unfair for you to send people to Nebraska uh, on a case, extra manpower, when they have less going on? And that's when you start comparing and de determining what discrimination is. I don't know if, Ed, you want to add, add something? No. <laughs> you did a good job. Yes. I have a question, and I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, the case, the outcome was that the FBI won, won in, res, in restoration because we, the Hispanics won as the plaintiffs, so the, the FBI lost as a case. And from that loss, it, 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 the FBI won because, uh, as um, Roberto said, women were promoted at an unprecedented rate within the FBI. Uh, I. I had a chance to go before a rifle place seniority panel and say, I, I should be at a grade 15 position, and they, I, I justified my position and I got it. So it was, they, uh, we weren't, uh, once, once you're given an opportunity, you're basically saying, hey, let me, let me fail. Give me the opportunity to fail. That's all I want. Um, just an opportunity to prove myself. That's what I want. Give it, give, give it to me. And there's there's people there there's Hispanics that have failed and there's Anglo's that have failed and blacks that have failed with all you know um, but then there's been a lot of them that have surprised people and been successful so it was yeah we won we won the law uh, the law, lawsuit um, we didn't get any the Hispanics didn't get any money it was basically a rightful place uh, seniority promotion where we were asked to go before an indiv individual panel to justify our positions. Um, but the FBI won. The FBI won because it became a, became a better agency. People, supervisors became s more sensitive. And Secret Service, the Bureau of Prisons, DEA, all these other agencies that were in, in law enforcement, they, they opened their books and said, we need to look at ourselves and see what's going on. Because if the FBI <laughs> can lose with the Department of Justice backing them up, we're going we're gonna to lose. So there, there, there was a lot of changes. I spoke at the Commodities uh, Futures Exchange com uh, Commission and, and they, uh, last week and a couple of uh, um, agents from their, the IG's office came up and said, hey, you made it better for us. And I think we did. I think IRS, I even got uh, uh, notices from, from IRS that we did it better. So it's the FBI won. They lost on, on the books, they lost, but the FBI really won. I just want to echo what Sam said. Uh, uh, first, off, first off, to clear the record, I, I wasn't as rich as Sam was when he when he was growing up. You know, <laughs> he, he had shoes. <laughs> no, but uh, Sam's absolutely right. The suit was righteous. Okay, uh, it it was never about money. Never about. I mean, nobody was saying, "Hey, uh, I want a million dollars to make me whole." It was never about the money. It was about being given a fair chance. You know, being given the same chance that your colleagues had, okay? And Sam is also right. Uh, the FBI became a better organization after the suit. However, 
if you were to look at the, if I could take you back to that era, you would think their dog died, <laughs> you know, because they were, they were appalled that they had lost the case. And, and you know, for, for us, it was, I mean, it was a no brainer. I mean, how could you not lose the case? I mean, for all the stuff that you were doing. And like Sam said, you know, it wasn't done out of evil. It was just done out of, done out of incompetence or, or stupidity or, or being uneducated. It's hard to describe. Uh, you know, don't get me wrong. I ran into some bigots in the FBI. I know a couple uh, that were outright bigots, okay, against Hispanics and blacks. And thank God they're retired and long gone. But um, the FBI uh, couldn't believe it, it had lost the case. And then when the the court told them, you know, what they had to do, I mean, it was it was like the the remedy was worse than the uh, than the actual uh, disease. Um, and I think that I think if if Sam will uh, back me up on this, I think the 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 fact that the bureau had to had to uh, had to uh, partake, you know, in in the remedies that the court set out. That was probably worse <laughs> than having to go through the trial because, I mean, it's like dragging a, a spoiled little kid down to the doctor's office to get a shot, you know. But Sam's absolutely right. The FBI and the government, you know, in general, became a better organization, and especially women. Um, my wife was an FBI agent at the time, you know, she became a supervisor and uh, probably because of the suit, you know, there were more opportunities for, for women that, that came open. Thank you, Sam. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, you testified at the hearing or at the, at the trial, but you weren't actually part of the, the lawsuit. Can you explain why? Well, it's like Sam said, you know, I, I grew up, uh, I'm, I'm a product of the, uh, well, my, my, my grandparents were a product of the, of the Great Depression. My parents were a product of the uh, World War II era. And, and I, I was their, their product, and I, I can't say Korean War, but um, I grew up in, a, in an environment where, you know, family, you know, the Great Spirit, church, you know, country, uh, respect for family, respect for elders, you know, love, honor, and, and all that stuff. Um, and uh, I, I'm a firm believer in, in that. You know, I, I, a friend of mine told me once, Ed, you are the worst employee to supervise. Uh, and I said, why? He said, because you're not loyal. He said, you're not loyal to any individual. He said, you're loyal to causes. You know, you're loyal to the Constitution. You're loyal to the Bill of Rights. You know, you're loyal to the rule of law. He said, if somebody stands in your way and he's not following the rule of law or not following the Constitution, he said, Ed, you'll screw him over in a heartbeat. You know, <laughs> so, I mean, and, and I, I very truly feel that way. The rule of law, okay, that's what we all stand for, justice, okay, and equality for everybody. I mean, that that's what guides me. That's my North Star, I guess you could say. And... Um, I looked at the family, I looked at the FBI as my second family, okay, and then I, I found out, it was like, it was a shock that uh, maybe your family wasn't as, uh, as wholesome as you thought it was. And it was very difficult for me to, um, to actually conceive of the fact that the FBI would, would be doing these things to, to its children, to, to its em employees. You know, so, and when the suit first started, I said, well, I, I support the suit, you know, in, in spirit, but I have not directly been involved or been uh, a victim of discrimination. But then as, as the suit progressed, I talked to more and more people involved in the suit. And then I, <laughs> as it turned out, uh, I was subject to a transfer uh, from Washington, D.C. to Miami. And um, there were some logistical issues where um, the FBI transferred someone from Miami to Washington at a full, full paid transfer. But when it came time to transfer me to Miami, they said, well, uh, we're doing you a favor by sending you to Miami. You have to pay your own way to Miami. Oh, wow. 
it's like, wait a minute, you know, isn't the government supposed to tra transfer its employees? Mm -hmm. They said, yeah, but, you know, uh, we're going to send your paycheck to Miami. If you want it, you got to go down there. <laughs> so anyway, that happened after the lawsuit had, had, been in, uh, had been going on for a while. So I joined at the, at the very end, you know, as a witness for the, uh, for the Perez side, you know, so. And it was very difficult. It was very difficult to testify. You know, it was like, you know, it was, as Sam said, it was one of the most difficult things I've done, probably more so than uh, almost as bad as getting shot, you know. <laughs> so, because I, I felt that was betraying a trust, you know, against a, an organization that's bigger than anyone, that's bigger than me. But then I stopped to, to rationalize it. You know, the trust had already been betrayed, you know, coming this way. Trust is a two-way street. Okay, and the, when I realized, you know, the, the trust had been betrayed coming this way, I didn't feel so bad when I, I thought I was betraying the trust going that way. Hope that answers your question, sir. <laughs> yeah, I, I joined the lawsuit and I had, I had reason for it, but if I didn't have the reason for it, I still would have seen it with the assignments and the, the being part of the taco circuit, part of the uh, angled helpers. I mean, I was, I was dragged in, uh, all over the place. But agents liked me because I, I did their investigations, I did their work, but, uh, and they, um, but I, th I thought it was unfair, and that's why the judge found systemic discrimination within the FBI because of the system that they, they had in place in, in using it. So I would have joined even if these incidents hadn't happened to me. Any other questions? Just to follow up on what Sam said, uh, our promotion system is based on, on, on your performance. Mm -hmm. Okay, how many arrests have you made you know, in, in the year 20, uh, 2016? How many people have you uh, interviewed? How many people have you indicted? Uh, how many people have you, uh, you know, prosecuted and so on and so forth? If you're a TDY from your, from your office, from your cases for three months, in, in some cases, six months, okay, that's six months that you're not, you're not working your, your stuff, you know, so you have le less stats, you know, less, you know, evidence that, to prove your worth, prove your co contribution to the cause. And the, the other guys, the guys that Sam would have to help, they would get their stats. You know, Sam would help them arrest people and indict people and interview people, but he never got the credit. The other guy got the credit. Okay, so it's like Sam's like, hey, Sam, you only have two, uh, two arrests this year, and, and Bill over there has 22. <laughs> it's like, we're going to promote Bill. It's like, wait a minute, I helped Bill <laughs> with those 22 arrests, you know, so. So th that's how... It, it affected the individuals. What what Ed's talking about is your your, your statistical accomplishments, but then I, I spoke last week. It's you're also your administrative profile, and your administrative profile is sometimes more important than 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 your statistics. If you look at some of the the way the promotions happen in, within an agency, it's it's who you know and not what you know, and so sometimes sometimes that happens. You have a question. Was there a mechanism now in place as a follow-up to kind of like that discrepancy where someone assists in, you know, helping you either provide transmission or you know, arrest, et cetera, like now they get credit for it as well? Well, now, now they have uh, um, Spanish speakers that aren't agents. Uh, a lot of them are, are doing, doing the, what they call the wires, uh, uh, interceding uh, conversations. Uh, they have them that, doing that. But as far as uh, they, I know that they were making attempts to hire more Spanish speakers. One of the things I didn't mention was that, that if, if you were Anglo and, and came in, uh, in under the Spanish program, there was a period when they op allowed you to opt out. Well, that policy never said it's only for Anglos. So some people, some Hispanics read it and said, hey, I want to get out of the program. So no, you can't because you're Hispanic. <laughs> so they, so it was unfair, unfair in, the, in that system. But yeah, there's, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's still cases out there that, uh, uh, where somebody needs a Spanish speaker because he doesn't, he goes into uh, an area where, it, uh, uh, and he doesn't speak. A case agent may not speak Spanish. I'm not sure how they're credited, in, credited in now, but uh, um, that, uh, it's, it's diminished. Uh, um, 
the burden on the Hispanics has diminished. Uh, I spoke to an agent last week who came out to the presentation, and he said he was, uh, um, it's, it's, it's a lot better than what it was. Yes, yes ma'am. <coughs> Do I, do I have any advice for people coming into the FBI? Um, yes, it's a great organization. Uh, it's, there's a lot of excitement. Each day is different. Um, you work with good people. Um, it's <laughs> most, mostly good people. It's until they get into management, then they become uh, <laughs> then they become evil. But, but, but uh, no, you have I have great friends and great colleagues in the in the bureau, and it's 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 a, it's a great career, and I, I recommend that field of work. They've, they've now gone from the criminal side more to security side because of the terrorism uh, threat that's in this in this country. But uh, uh, it's an exciting field. It's 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 and it's a great opportunity for women. And women are, are are promoted. They're in charge of offices and everything, everything else. So it's a good opportunity. I have some books that are signed back there for to sell. Uh, it's also on Audible.com that you can get it. Uh, if you live in D.C., you can. It's under ten hours, so you can probably in, in two commutes you can <laughs> you, you can go through the, go through the book. But uh, thank you very much for having me and having Ed up here. We appreciate it. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.